cuttings from and as you can see these generally need to find a good home or we need to have enough donations of volunteers to be able to have things like this in bigger pots so um, thankfully though it's gonna uh, make a whole bunch of new plants but uh, this is what happens when we kind of have to juggle things around and they kind of are searching for soil so they definitely are happier in the ground or when they have a bigger pot Try to, make, try to make the soil thicker on the end okay. here. You know, so it's more like half a pot there. Then, like that. Okay, and then and like then right can, there. Yeah. Uh, I also should have explained sorting the pots. We oh. have a lot of bad pots. Okay, so this is a. Uh, so Amanda's getting the hang of that, and Michael's going to explain the uh, the selection that we the section we probably should have done in the beginning, and we might edit this at the beginning. Who knows? But it's uh, when you're picking out pots, um, there's uh, depending on what you're doing it for, but some of them are kind of worn out, and I can explain this a little bit. But uh, Michael can demonstrate uh, if depending on if we're going to put a whole bunch of them, like if we're going to put a bunch of cuttings or seeds in one pot and uh, just set it in the nursery to kind of sprout, then uh, if it's got a loose lip, then it's not that big of a deal. But if we're gonna pot them individually, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, we're, we want them to have a little bit more uh, structural integrity because we can spill soil, right? Yeah, like so. if we're, especially for something like this, these are plants that may sit in our greenhouse for two or three years before they get adopted. Hopefully they'll get adopted sooner than that, but they could be in here for two or three years. All of our pots are secondhand. Some of them are more worn out than others. Pots get photodegraded by being out in the sun. And you can see this one is fairly degraded. It still looks like a, a pretty good pot. We could put soil in there, we could plant one of these in there, and it could sit in the nursery for a, you know, a little while. And then when we go to take it to a sale, we pick this up and the, pot, the rim just snaps. You can see here, we got a crack in the rim there. There's something. Bug climbing on my neck here. <laughs> so make sure you wear your bug spray. Yeah, I don't know what that was, but it's climbing on me. <laughs> anyway, so this this pot, you see how it's starting to crack kind of all over the place. That is a sign that this pot has photodegraded and is just brittle and not something you want to use. Because especially sitting out in the nursery another couple of years, there's probably not going to be much integrity left to this rim, and it's just going to split when we try to pick up the pot and dump the soil out and. When you're running late trying to load up for a sale, that is, that's the last thing you want. So is there any other ways you uh, recommend you to test? That's, that's broken. So basically, you know, you grab it, you, you, know, you, you give, it a, give it a good yank. Make sure nothing breaks. And, and if it does, if there's a little crack somewhere, put it in the discard. So that's, that's not a pot we want to use. We'll, Either we'll try to give that away if somebody else doesn't mind broken pots, or we might use that for starting seeds if, if it's only going to be used for a month and then we're going to transplant stuff out of it. It doesn't really matter if the, pot, if the rim's in good shape. Uh, this is another one that I, I like to pull out of the discard. Well, it's sort of a different category. If you can see, the, there's a slight difference in size. This one is just a slightly lo lower volume. So for things like this, I usually use for plants that are going to stay small or the creeping vining kind of things like the mint that we do and the uh, go-to cola. I save these pots for them because they, except this one's got a break in the rim, so this one's going in the discard. But uh, if I find intact ones of those, I use those for the mints and the go-to colas and things because they don't really need a big pot. Something like this that is going to get as big as it can in that pot possibly before it gets sold. I want to give it more, you know, the, the full cheater one gallon room. That, that's even smaller than the, this is known as a cheater one gallon. It's not actually one gallon or it's usually just referred to as a one gallon, but real one gallon pots are slightly bigger than this. And this one's even smaller than that. So uh, we only use those for certain, certain things that don't need much of a pot. And the next step is to protect these from drying out, we put a bag on top of them. And we try to pull this down as about as tight as we can, and that helps reduce the amount of water that will pool up there. Sometimes I try to make sure there are enough 
cuttings poking up to hold the bag up so that the water sheds off. This is going to fill up a little bit, but hopefully it won't be too bad. So we pull that down and we're going to open up the string. Any scissors? Yes, we will need something to cut the string with. I actually usually use a lighter for nylon string. That. So the way I generally like to, to do this is tie a bowline at the end, it makes a loop that doesn't shrink. Put this around here, put that through the loop. I want to come around here to see that. That way I can make a, a knot that a slip knot that will that will tighten on here. And then I pull that back on there and put one more in. A lot of times when we're doing this with figs or mulberries and we need to know what variety it is, we'll hang a tag on here or we'll drop a tag inside there. But for right now this one's done and it goes into the shade. If we were to leave this out in the sun it would cook all of the cuttings. And since they're since they have no roots you need to be nice to them and give them a little shade. So, another bag. Um, who wants to go next? Well, go ahead. And about how many how many new plants do we make just from that that one plant of cuttings? Uh, I don't know. Don't don't count your cuttings before they're rooted. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's the white stuff called? Perlite. Perlite. Another was it's volcanic a, ash. Uh, it's a, volcanic the perlite ash. is a is a it's a expanded volcanic glass. And the oh, vermiculite wow. is an expanded mica, and I think they actually have to heat the mica to get it to puff up. I'm not really sure. But that's, that's the stuff that looks like little accordions. And what does that do again? It holds in the moisture? Um, and aerates it a little bit? Yeah, it's a, it provides a good aerated medium for the roots to grow into. It doesn't. It keeps them from getting too saturated. Because roots, when the new roots, when they're growing, need a lot of air and not too much water, but they need to also have access to the moisture. And okay. so this medium provides a good mix of, of those two characteristics. That's a little bit much. I would pull out some of that. So you're saying that you you want to do that halfway? A little bit more than half. Okay. That's good. At least that's what we've been doing. All right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty so good. what we're actually doing here is uh, we're taking cuttings and uh, rooting them, which is like, an, like a natural form of cloning. Let me see here, Sam. Oops, sorry. Sam and Ying are uh, putting those in there. And these are the Pacific, dense, the so Pacific yeah. spinach. You'll probably get by with four pots of that instead of five. Okay. I'll make them. Okay, so this is one of the main methods that we use to propagate our plants, is to, um, to root them uh, from cutting. And we'll cover them up with a bag and, uh, and encourage the root growth, and then we'll uh, dig them back up and separate them once they uh, start getting uh, the roots start to take. And so we're packing those in there a little bit more dense because uh, some of them you can do that. You can put a lot of them in there. As long as we have enough volunteers and we dig them up in time so they're not too crazy. Uh, this this uh, section is about um, when you have uh, a bunch of plants either from cuttings or from seed and uh, you're starting them off and they, you, you start them off in a small plant and then you uh, split up the ones that uh, that grew nice and happy and uh, they kind of got a little bit uh, too crowded or they will be if we kept them in there so what we do is we're going to split them up and put them in these individual pots and uh, so Michael is going to demonstrate uh, some of the best practices for uh, doing this. So one of the things you want to do is not squish the plants under your hand when you're taking this out. Um, there are a few ways of doing that. Sometimes you can fit your fingers in between them, sometimes you can't. Um, a lot of times you need to massage the pot to try to loosen it around the edges. Uh, and you can find somewhere where you can support it and you pull the pot off like that. This one seems to have worked out real well. I'm going to put this one back because we already have one started. This is a small amount from one, one of these we did before, but we didn't transplant all of them. So we've still got a clump here that we 
stuck back in a pot to finish later. And now I'll show you how to separate some of these. This is basically how it was in the old pot. It's grown a few new roots into the new soil. But basically we you just want to try to carefully separate the roots. And it looks like there are a few in this clump. And when you plant them, you want to be real careful that you get the depth right. You want to plant them so that so that the soil is right about there, where right about where the roots start. If it's too deep, it can negatively impact the roots. Is that with all plants or just with the, those these type of it's, guavas? Uh, with most plants, there are some plants that like to be planted deep, like tomatoes, for one. But for most plants, you want to put it about at the level it was when it was a seedling. Uh, or if you can't exactly tell that. You want to start it, you want to put the soil line right about where the first root starts. Now, to plant something like this, there are a few different methods I use to tr move a transplant into a new pot. This is one of my favorites, where I put it about halfway and squish, it, squish the soil against the side. Then I drop the plant in here, and I hold it right at about the right level. So you can see yeah. that there? Yeah. Okay. And I keep the pot tilted. Hold this at approximately the right level, and then I'll fill up this, this side. I'm going to have to push that in there a little bit. And by doing that, I can get the pot filled just about right and have the plant at right, about the right depth in the soil. So that is transplanted. It need to be watered still, and then we'll put that in the shade house to let it get re-adjusted re re Reacclimatized is, uh, I don't know, I can't think of the right word, but let, let the roots grow into the soil of the new pot, let it get adjusted. Yeah, so um, do you have any other suggestions about the, uh, the, the level or the, um, the, the height? Because I know that uh, we've, we've talked about this, you know, off video in the past about um, how the level of it and uh, whether it, uh, rain runs off of it or uh, those kind of things, if you can touch on that for a second. Oh yeah, you, you definitely want to have the level of soil below the rim of the pot. If the soil is mounded up above it, water will run off instead of soaking in. But also, we want to use as much of the pot as we can. So this one is actually not, as, not quite as full as I usually like to make them, but the most important thing is not to have this planted deep. Uh, so this is, and this is, this is acceptable. Uh, normally I'd, I'd want to put a little bit more soil in there just to get it up almost to the level of the rim, uh, but, but that's all right. So uh, introduction to um, the potting and propagation. Uh, this is Amanda. Hi. Uh, she's a new volunteer. This is her first time out here. And so uh, she just watched us explain um, the, the, the earlier part that you had seen, uh, mostly observing, so now she's uh, got her nice brand new clean gloves on we provided, and she's um, going through and um, playing these up, and so uh, we just want to show you that, you know, it's not, it's not insanely complicated, um, it's, it's hands-on, um, and, and anybody can do it, and uh, you don't have to be, uh, you know, a, a plant horticulture major or anything like that to, to be able to help with this and do this. Um, just follow Michael's instructions and guidance earlier, and it's always good to have somebody um, experienced, though, in the group to uh, point out uh, little things, like if something's, uh, you know, maybe a little not at the right level or, or such. Um, but in general, um, it's pretty straightforward, um, and the more hands that we can get, even if it's an hour, or uh, a couple hours, um, once a month, every few months, uh, one time. Um, ideally, if you come out more than one time, so that way you know uh, what to do and you have an idea. So, ta-da, number two already. <laughs> so, that way you have an idea. Also, you want to make sure you press the soil down. Get it See. So you want to compress yeah, the soil want, a little uh, bit? You don't want it too okay. loose because it's going to, and that looks like it's a little deep also. So you might want to try that again. Yeah, so it's really good for us to, to we really want to have someone uh, out here generally that... So how deep exactly do you put it again? Um, right about where, see where the first roots come uh -huh. out there? That's about where the top should be. Okay. And also, let's, oh, I think we just have to dump it out. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, that, that's how it goes sometimes, <laughs> I mean. 
I've been doing this for a long time, and, and yeah. I still get corrected, so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I correct people all the time. So yeah. one of the purposes for, for squishing it against the side here is to get part of it somewhat compacted. The soil is very fluffy, especially with all this coffee chaff in here. And if we don't get it squished while it's in the pot, it's going to squish eventually, and then we're going to have half a pot with, of soil, and, and that's, that's kind of unprofessional. Uh, <laughs> you want to give your plant as much soil as the pot has room for, and you want to have it at the right level. Now, soil compaction is generally considered a problem in forests and whatnot, but we're just pressing on it with our fingers, we're not driving trucks over it. So. That's, it's a different sort of compaction. We're, we're just pressing out the, the air spaces and the extra fluff. And you see, I'll, let me dig down here a little bit and show you where the roots start. So you can see... Like pretty much at the top? Pretty much right at the top there. So that's, I, I got that pretty much right where I was aiming. And and that's what you want to do. And you know, you also want to push it down to get rid of the excess fluff. And make so sure it's not. Uh, make sure you don't have half a pot of soil that looks like a full pot. Yeah. So it's kind of an art and a science. And uh, so I was starting to say that <laughs> um, it, it helps. You know, if you have a little bit of experience, but it's not required. And uh, it's always good to have um, other people that you know can guide. Um, some of this really basic stuff. Uh, so that's why we're making this video oh. to uh... <gasps> Where? Oh. <laughs> And again, everything we've done is uh, we're all volunteer run and so last year when we moved into this new location We built this uh, greenhouse and uh, with your donations and uh, all our plant sales this is one of the things that uh, besides the soil mixes that it went into is this is our Fancher Smancha greenhouse, and uh, this is in case it gets too too cold. We got some reserve propane tanks for uh, when it gets really cold, and uh, we're tapped into Crazy Woman Farm Solar Bank, so we have a little bit of electrical use. And so when we're starting off plants, even though we grow things that are well for our area, we do have some that are a little more cold sensitive, or at least when they're at the younger stages. Um, they're, they're a lot more sensitive, so we have some uh, pretty hardy figs, um, some bananas, uh, we thought why not, some mulberries, uh, some really healthy blueberries, and you want to get at least more than one variety of blueberry if you're uh, going to want to get some fruit. They like to cross-pollinate uh, turmeric, which is one of the key ingredients in curry, um, that kind of makes it yellowish orange color and it's um, very anti-cancerous, uh, anti-phlegmatic, really good for you. It's uh, related to ginger. Uh, this is arrowroot which is a type of tuber. You can use it like a, a carb starch and also as a thickening agent. Uh, this is Nepali cactus which is thornless and you can even buy that. I've only seen it in Walmart uh, in their produce section but one of these pads will cost you about four bucks. And uh, you can eat those in the Lunchbox Cafe, sells those uh, in tacos. So if you ever want to try that and see how it tastes. And they're just a really good attractive landscape plant. Um, here's some more of the chaya uh, spinach tree. Uh, some more of the type of guavas that we grow in our area. And we have some pomegranates. And the same thing, you want to try and get more than one variety of pomegranate ideally. But yes, you can grow them well here in the split off and make a whole bunch of different branches and um, so there you go and this is a and you see how big some of the I have a large hand and you see how big that that mulberry leaf is so that's a really good nice solar panel to uh, make all that sugar and uh, there's a, a grasshopper buzzing in here I sneak in and eat all of our plants. I guess he knows what's up. So, uh, this is one of our cranberry hibiscus, which makes these really pretty flowers, and you can eat the leaves, and they, you can see, you can eat the leaves, uh, so they, um, make a really good tea, and you can add on the salad, and 
Here's a better example of the pigeon pea. Uh, the really nice flower of those. It's really attractive. And then that'll turn into a lentil pod. Um, and this is one of our other shade nurseries. So when we're starting off plants, especially in the winter time, where they still need to be covered up and uh, not burn up, especially on the hot days. Um, this is one of the sections of our other other varieties of fig. Like I said, we have eight types. And then there's a mango kind of in the mix there, but that's a really cool uh, dwarf variety. And uh, we're going to start grafting those and hopefully be able to start growing mangoes here in North Florida. Um, this is a fiberless black sugar cane. This is a really fancy one that we got hooked up with. And so we've been growing those and they're very tasty. You get a lot more juice out of them and less fiber. Which um, fiber meaning, you know, it's just going to be pithy. Um, these are a hot weather lettuce that we want to encourage everybody to grow. This is um, called India lettuce. We originally got these from Echo down in uh, Naples, Fort Myers area. And we built this enclosure because the uh, wascally rabbits <laughs> have been coming in and uh, eating these because they know they're delicious. <laughs> but uh, these get really tall and they almost look like they're bolting the seed. And they're slightly bitter, but they're, uh, they're pretty good. And if you can mix them in with other greens or... Uh, it's just one of those other things you can grow in the hot weather, including this, the coxcomb or quail grass. And it makes these really beautiful flowers. They're naturally insect resistant. They, uh, you can see there's, they're not getting eaten up by bugs, but you want to boil the water and drain it. Um, and so here's some more of the lamb's quarters. And we don't usually have enough volunteers, uh, so a lot of these ended up not getting put out in the field. So they would have been better out in the field, and so these are a little too late to plant. So uh, next time, if you want to help out, uh, you'd be surprised just what an hour, even one time or every once in a while will do to contribute to how much food we can produce for the area. Um, you see here the coxcomb has a whole bunch of little other flowers that it's going to start off. Um, this is called uh, Go-To Cola, which uh, you could buy at some Spanish um, stores or in health food stores and uh, a lot of commercial teas for uh, energy so it's meant known to be a natural stimulant um, help your cognitive function supposedly and uh, energy and this is another tropical um, pretty sure it's a Adamoya or a, a sweet sop um, this is the African basil which makes these really uh, pretty purple flowers which you don't have any at the moment which is good because they're kind of hard to maintain. They grow so fast you have to maintain them. But it grows into a, a pretty good sized bush. Um, this is from South Florida. It's called Carissa. It has these uh, mild thorns and it makes this really beautiful uh, white flower. We have one right here. And it has a really good fragrance like a honey blossom. And it makes these uh, reddish fruits that are kind of sweet and tart called the uh, natal plum or Carissa. And uh, this is some of the Cuban oregano, you can see uh, how big that it can get, and this is less than a year old. And we've done a bunch of cuttings off of it, and this thing's really prolific. Um, have a, a tropical uh, Central South uh, South American uh, plant called Katuk, and uh, it, that's also a really nutritious green. It's high in protein. Uh, this is the more of the cranberry hibiscus. And you see it's growing like crazy. And this gigantic stand of it is really just growing from a sad one gallon pot. So if you're the kind of person who say you don't really have a lot of time <laughs> to take care of your plants. Uh, look how big this is. And this is neglected to say the least. And hardy. So if you're looking for stuff that you know, you're not really a plant person or you think it's not going to survive, that's uh, living proof right there. Um, we also have a couple pineapples for fun and some avocados. We're trying to develop and start growing more cold hardy, cold hardy avocados and again our mango project. And you can see these are some of the chayas. Amanda, can you stand next to that so we can see, get an idea about how tall they are? So. <laughs>
So they get pretty big. So they uh, pump out a lot of food for you. Um, we also have some other kinds of sugar cane and, and stuff. But that's pretty much our, our nursery in a nutshell. Okay, so this is kind of a joke, obviously, because all we grow are edibles. Uh, <laughs> Michael can't hear, because they're over there building an enclosure, but that's great. Um, these are our super low quats, uh, some pomegranates that we're going to split up. And so we have two gates. We have our uh, main entrance here. This is Amanda, one of our first-time volunteers. <laughs> and uh, this is our greenhouse. And with the tanks that we don't really use unless there's an emergency, our uh, basic irrigation system. We have um, some wild stuff growing, like spotted bee balm and mint. We're using to keep out the other plants. Um, some uh, vining plants, including uh, grapes. And uh, we're trying to um, root those from the cuttings. Um, and... These are some chachucha peppers, or turban peppers. They're um, mild, they're not spicy, but they're pretty cool and they make a lot of fruit. Um, we have some strawberries, mostly for us to eat whenever we're out here in season. Uh, this is called sochan, which is uh, an edible green. It was really popular with Native Americans. Um, it's actually native, but not so much in Gainesville, kind of towards the Panhandle and towards Georgia, uh, where those grow. These are the uh, edible fruiting cactus, and uh, they make a really uh, antioxidant-rich um, purple pear. They're called La Tuna in uh, Spanish cultures. You can even buy those at Publix. Um, these are some of the figs. Uh, we have about eight different varieties of figs, and what's good about that is for disease resistance, and also they have different taste. And also what's cool is they fruit at different times of the year. So most fruit around late late June to early August and right now it's September mid-September and they're, these have fruit on them so that's pretty exciting to have a longer fruit season um, these are some of our thornless blackberries and I believe that's a wild cherry um, this was a type of pear and um, this thing got huge and it was actually growing in a one gallon pot the poor thing and it pretty much was growing with no soil and got huge so that's pretty hardy so we're we focus on stuff like that that's real hardy for the area so that aluminum foil on there is what they call an air layer and where one of the types of cloning methods organically is you could um, grow roots on the branch so you put some um, moist material in there and seal it off and it'll grow roots on the branch and then you can snip it and then from that point it'll be a new plant um, and these are some more of our thornless blackberries. We have a couple different types. Um, some of our cold hardy guavas, and we have two kinds of that. And these are the native lamb's quarter. And you can see these are starting to create seeds. And sometimes we grow things just so we can collect the seeds because we have a seed bank. And we uh, sell those really cheap and also plant those out in the whenever the time is right and that's like a kind of edible it's an edible that's very similar to spinach in taste and really nutritious this is a yucca or a cassava uh, which you can get in any grocery store and it's a really popular in Latin America and um, in the Dominican Republic and Haiti they make bread out of it too uh, this is chaya or the Mexican spinach tree and um, that is twice as nutritious as spinach it's a little cold sensitive, but it's a perennial shrub, and if you cover it well, it'll grow back. And uh, if you have a latex allergy, it does create a little bit of latex when you pluck it. So just a little caution on that, but otherwise it's really delicious. And you can mix it in with a starch like mashed potatoes or something, it's pretty good. Um, these are Jer Jerusalem artichokes, or sunchokes, and that's a tuber, and it's also a sunflower. So you eat the root of the sunflower, which is pretty cool. And they're really delicious, and they're kind of expensive in the store, so it's nice to grow things like this on your own. Same with figs. Figs are pretty expensive in the store, but they're really underutilized in gardens around here, most part. Uh, these are goldenrod, 
which uh, make these really pretty yellow flowers and uh, this is the start of them and you can make tea out of it and it's uh, good for you and these are some of our blueberries some of our older ones and um, we try and take things out of the shade nursery and put them out here in the sun and these are some of our sugar cane we actually have a special fiberless variety of sugar cane so that's really delicious you can chomp on that and it won't be all stringy uh, we had tried to grow some passion fruits, but it didn't grow too well for some reason, so we're trying to figure that out. But these are moringas. The Miraculous Moringa, which is uh, great for vegetarians. Um, it's grown in Africa, especially to alleviate hunger. And uh, NPR has been featuring that, so people have been scooping these up. And it's highly nutritious, green. Uh, it becomes a small tree that will grow back in the spring. And it's really high in potassium and calcium and, and protein. And uh, so it's super healthy for you. Um, this is some of our Jamaican sorrel, uh, which the leaves have like a lemon flavor, really good for adding the salads. You can make tea with them. Particularly the flowers uh, turn into a fruit, quasi-fruit, called a calyx, and you can make tea out of it. It's, it's used all over the world, and including in the States, as a commercial tea like Tazo Passion or Red Zinger. Uh, this, these are some more of our strawberries. And, and just kind of a little bit of variety of stuff. One of our um, mulberries, which is a, about a 15, 20 foot tree that makes a ton of berries. And it's not a bush, it's a tree. Um, and that, that'll make a bunch of fruit. That's kind of like a blackberry. Uh, these are pigeon peas which uh, is a, a shrubby legume or a bean, more like a lentil. And you see here there's the, the, the pod and it makes a pretty flower that turns into the pod. And these are a whole bunch of the bee balm, the spotted bee balm. And you can see these little guys and girls maybe, but they're uh, having a ball and they're uh, you know, there's bees all over the place, um, just kind of lapping them up. So they're great pollinators, really good addition if you're growing any fruit. And uh, you can use them like oregano or make a tea. Uh, they supposedly have medicinal properties. Uh, this is some rosemary, which grows really great in, in central Florida. Uh, it'll just spread and take over. It's really awesome, real low maintenance. You can grow, grow it wild. Um, And I don't recall off the top of my head what these are. I want to say that they're a type of plum, uh, but I don't know off the top of my head. So we need some help labeling stuff. Um, here's something kind of off-season. Uh, September, we actually have mulberries, which there are... Um, I actually think this is ever one of our ever-bearing mulberries, so they have more than one crop. And so this is what I was just describing, and uh, they're pretty delicious. They just don't last well off the shelf, so you don't really find these in the store. Uh, but that's one of our um, our key plants. This is a type of a black raspberry that somebody gave us. It does have thorns, but they're pretty tasty. Um, whoa! <laughs> the bees. All right, so this is lemongrass, uh, which you can in Jamaica they call it fever grass, and you can make uh, tea out of it. You can make kind of like a lemonade. It's pretty tasty. Uh, you can use the roots uh, to uh, insert in the chicken and kind of marinate. Uh, you can also use it for soups. It's really uh, popular uh, in uh, Thai cooking and uh, Vietnamese cooking. And uh, here's some more of our, our thornless blackberries and the chickens in the background. And this is one of the other pears that I was mentioning, the, uh, the survivor pears. And we always need help with weeds. These are a really invasive uh, weed that's just kind of taken over everything. So um, you don't have to know anything about plants to pull these weeds. It's, uh, we grow everything very naturally and use organic practices. So um, pulling weeds is definitely a way to help us do that. Um, Alright, so that's the, the basic outside area. Action.
This is katuk. We often call it kaput because it kind of looks like that. It's a leaf vegetable that comes from the lowland rainforest of Borneo. And it's the only euphorb that I've ever heard of that people eat the leaves raw. So, for any minute, you want to try some? I think we've had this before. You haven't had it or she's had it? Yeah, yeah I don't believe so. Good. Yeah? And doesn't it have these little flowers on it too? It does have these little flowers. Ours, you can see this, there's one, one of them over here. Ours never Well, I got a fruits. good shot of it. Okay, got it? Pretty decent. There's some, some more little open ones here. It's a fruit? Did they make a fruit? And I think you can eat the fruit, but ours never have because... See, this one's it's got some, some petals on You can see that. Ours never fruit because we only ever got one individual and they require cross-pollination for fruiting. So these so that are means that means that they need to have another another one or another kind. It needs to have a genetically distinct individual to cross pollinate with. We take cuttings, and a lot of people are always asking me if I have two clones, can they cross pollinate? No, because it's still the same plant, just in two spots. You know. So it's, it's like, kind of like inbreeding. It's 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 a, it's You're a trying prevention. to inbreed. It's a it's a way the plant <laughs> has developed to prevent inbreeding in order to get more genetic diversity in its offspring. Uh, you know, asking if, if, if two clones, if two different trees that are the same variety can cross-pollinate with each other is sort of like expecting two branches on the same tree to cross-pollinate with each other. And of course, they know that they're the same, so they're not going to do that. Hmm. Some, some plants will self, some plants are self-fertile, some plants are not. This one is one that's not. Um, so these are some cuttings that I collected from some of our plants growing in the nursery to make more of them. And we're going to cut these up and put them in the rooting medium. And so um, where did you get these actually and what are some of the benefits? Because we are the Edible Plant Project. So um, why is it that uh, we're growing this one? I think this came from Echo. And I Just kind of like us, but they're down in Fort Myers, Naples area and they're faith base but they're uh, they're kind of like us right they have an edible nursery for outreach and such they, they do a lot of missionary work in tropical areas third world countries and they help people by sharing seeds and plants and ideas they try to make subsistence agriculture a little bit more effective which is uh, a lot of what we also do, and uh, they've helped us. We've gotten a lot of our, our a lot of plants from them, originally uh, directly or indirectly. And um, so, why is it that you're uh, trimming all the leaves off? Well, as you can notice, this little twig does not have very many roots. Like and none. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, if if I were to just go stick a branch out in the ground it's just going to dry up and die. Anybody who's done that knows that's what happens. But if you cut off most of the leaves, it, there's a lot less area for it to lose water from, and it's less likely to dry up. And we put it in a plastic bag also. We put it in some, some good reading medium. Yeah, we have, another, we have another section, of another video on that too. Yeah. To cover it. And, uh, and that helps maintain the high humidity to keep the cutting from drying up until it can grow roots and be able to provide water for itself. So do you have any tips uh, besides, I guess just general tips on uh, how to take a, a branch like this and uh, make cuttings? Because when you were doing the uh, Pacific spinach, I, I missed this part uh, on the footage. Because um, I'll probably splice this in uh, with the other ones. Well, basically, you usually want to avoid the very tender tips, although sometimes the tips are the parts that work best. Uh, but this one's looking very tender, so I'm going to clip that off. Uh, you may want to leave a few, a few leaves on so that it's able to photosynthesize at least a little bit while it's trying to grow roots, but you want to still keep it in the shade so that it doesn't have to deal with intense solar heat. Then we put it in there. We want to cut them about six to eight inches for most things. And we put them in a pot all together so that we can put a bag over it, keep the humidity up, not all of these are going to take. Some of them are going to die, and that, this is a way that we can sort them out and use better use our, our resources more efficiently. We could put each pot, each each cutting, in its own pot with its own bag and its own string, but then 
we would be having some difficulty because the rooting medium is not well fertilized. Well fertilized soil is not good for growing roots into. So if we just did each one in its own pot and then uh, had to, then we have, and, and use rooting medium, we would have to add fertilizer on top of that. And since we don't have really an organic granular fertilizer we can just throw in, what we like to do is use horse manure and, and uh, a lot of other things that we mix in to provide fertility. It really works better for us to get it rooted in the rooting medium and then take it out and transplant it once it's grown some roots into fertile soil and then it can then it can take off. Alright, so uh, do you have any other tips? Because I noticed that you uh, had cut some that are green and uh, so some plants like uh, like yucca, cassava for instance um, you would cut the woody ones, but I noticed mm -hmm. that we're doing the green ones. So I guess in this particular plant it doesn't matter, uh, well, I'm assuming. I guess you just need to experiment a little bit. Some things like cuttings closer to the tips, and th some things like the big thick branches at the bottom. Uh, most things do better from cuttings near the tips, but yucca and what's the other one I was thinking of. Moringa. And they probably Chaya too? Chaya, yeah, Chaya probably also. They seem to like the, the big thick parts at the bottom. So do you have any um, suggestions on how to eat or how to cook uh, the katuk? No. Cook the katuk? I, I mean, you can eat it raw, obviously, and yeah. it's pretty tasty. It's got a good, good mild taste to it. You throw it in a salad. It's a little bit tougher than I like for salad greens, but it, it is salable. Yeah. Supposedly you can, you can cook it. I don't have any recipes for it. I don't really eat this much. I've heard that it's called a, a tropical asparagus in places where it's grown. And that if you fertilize it heavily, it can grow real thick succulent tips that are actually somewhat like asparagus, although it's not at all related. It doesn't grow that well here, so maybe yeah. you have to go to Borneo to get your tropical asparagus. So, so one of the things is uh, to communicate to people that uh, something is edible. Um, there are things that are not related to the actual name at all. I mean, Michael is well known. He uses the Latin names uh, very frequently. However, um, you know, it's much easier to call things. Um, here, I'm gonna flip this over. You see, well, I can't. Anyway, so if you, like, you know, right, so if we call things like Pacific spinach, Okinawa spinach, the spinach tree. It's just, like, for, for wording, you know, to communicate to people, hey, you can eat that. Or it's just easier to pronounce to people who don't use Latin words or never heard of it. It's completely new to them. Um, you know, just to, to communicate to them, hey, this is something that you can eat. And it just kind of conveys a different level of comfort and familiarity uh, in our language, especially people who are new to the whole concept of uh, edible plants outside of you know a typical garden and what's that you find at Publix, right? Yep. So, so if you're wondering, those are every we don't have a million different crazy varieties of spinach. It's just <laughs> they're, they're called these things often to communicate edibility. The funny thing is, we have a lot of things that actually are close relatives to spinach and actually taste like spinach, and yet they're not called spinach. <laughs> we have all these things that are nothing like spinach at all, and they're called spinach. Okay, so what, what do you think would be an example of something like that is related to spinach that isn't called it? Tellaloo, and all the amaranths. Close relatives to spinach, taste like spinach. You can cook them like spinach or eat um, Probably don't want to eat them raw, but use them in any cooked spinach recipe, and they're a real good substitute. But uh, nobody ever calls Kalaloo spinach. <laughs> and they call a lot of other things Kalaloo, ironically, too. Yeah, that, that's another confusing part. <laughs> so that's why the Latin words are the best. Just, you know, if you're into that, um, that is one of the best things to do. If you want to get into edible plants, um, it gives you a better idea of um, you know, the, the, the true names of it so you don't get confused. Because colloquially, things can have uh, the same name but be totally different um, or you'll have the same plant but it has like ten different names across the world so. and I 
I guess tropical spinach, or I'm sorry, trop tropical asparagus sounds a little bit more appealing than katuk or sauropus androgynus. What was the name again? Sourpuss? So sauropus. Oh. <laughs> Almost sourpuss, but not quite. Well, it's not sour though, so it tastes good. Yeah.